Okay, I'm going to apologize right now for the <laughs> unsteadiness of the camera right now. And also the eye line then was kind of a little bit off, but whatever. Um, when I was at the dentist's office today, and this is going to be one that's totally tagged up with hashtag when you were the Orville. Um, but it's something that for newcomers to the series, like for people who haven't seen it before, but is maybe into Star Trek, just some comparisons there that I noticed actually between Voyager and um, the Orville. Uh, that I think people will be able to see if they really watch the series, like both series. If you haven't seen other series, well then this probably won't be the video for you. But if you're a if you're someone who compares the series, and I'll admit I watched Voyager when it first came out, um, mostly because of the fact that I loved the idea of there being a female captain. Now, there's the dynamic in Voyager, of course, female captain, and of course, the male first officer who's from another ship um, in their series, the two ships, the Maquis ship, and they're like a bunch of rebels who are fighting against something going on in their storyline. Uh, both ships are sucked 40,000 light years away from where they come from. And the Mackie ship is ruined. And the whole crew from the Mackie ship is brought on board Voyager. Now the captain of the Mackie ship becomes the first officer. So it's this really awkward relationship there um, where, um, I mean, yes, Janeway's the captain, but she always listens to her first officer whenever needed. And in, uh, in the Orville, yes, Captain Mercer is the captain. But this is a huge thing that you see in the pilot episode. At the very end of it, well, for one thing, his first officer is his ex-wife. I'm not going to get into the dynamics of how they became exes. But she felt rotten about what had happened. And so she speaks up on his behalf to make sure that Ed gets that captain's position. So in a lot of ways, she's a little bit more like Janeway because she takes charge of a situation even when other people don't realize that she's doing it. Like, yes, okay, Captain Mercer is the captain of the Orville in that series. But she's one who's always got her eye out for, for certain things, which also leads to another comparison. In Voyager, the, and there's the, uh, the chief engineer, and Janeway has an idea as to who she thinks should get it, someone who has the official Starfleet training kind of thing. And her first officer, Chakotay, speaks up and says, well, what about Bolana? Now, Bolana is a, a young woman who is half human, half Klingon. Rather volatile comparison there. Or volatile background, I should say. Ethnicity. And she's been known to break a few people's noses and stuff like that. So Janeway doesn't think that she'd be the best one to have in charge of a department. But she does eventually see how brilliant and intelligent intelligent this young woman is. So she he, does what her first officer suggests and gives this young woman, Bolana Torres, that position. Compare it to the Orville, where her, well, one of the pr biggest pranksters on the ship is John Lamar, and he's the navigator. But when he pulls a stunt, like a joke, practical joke that goes way too far. Um, Callie, the first officer, decides, okay, I'm going to look into his background here, see why he's such an idiot. And she discovers he's anything but. He has aptitudes off the scale for engineering and smarts. And so she speaks up and tells uh, Mercer, well, I think you should give John the chance. 
at this position because the he, former uh, chief of uh, like engineering chief or head of engineering, whatever you want to call it, has taken on a much cushier job where he's not having to be on a ship. So they're trying to find a replacement for this man. And to, at first Mercer's like, well, I don't know about this because he's never shown any indication of being a leader. And she's like, well, give him a chance. And like Janeway, um, like Janeway gives a challenge to Bolana. And Mercer does the same. Well, well, he begrudgingly gives the same chance to Lamar and is very pleasantly surprised at how he handles himself and how he solves the problem and really how much of a genius he is. And with Lamar's background, he's one who was raised in the colony where, as he put it, if you show you're too much of an egghead, uh, you didn't make friends very quickly. So when he winds up getting that position because he finally has the freedom to show his genius, which is the same as with Bolana, where she finally has that chance, that opportunity, where her background isn't taken into consideration in terms of her ethnicity, how she was raised, all that, but her brains, same as with John Lamar. And certainly, he, one of the other things that I found really interesting, and it, it dawned on me today when I was in the dental chair, was uh, the helmsman. Now, you might not think that Tom Paris from Voyager and... Um, uh, I should remember the character's name. Um, Malloy, the Gordon Malloy, that they have too much in common, but they do. And that both of them have been kicked out of their positions as helmsmen. Uh, with, um, with Tom, it was that there was something that had happened, and um, he was convinced, um, and the implication is threatened, basically, to, uh, to admit to something that he might not have done, and as a result, he's been thrown into a prison. And Janeway pick, pulls him out of the prison and says, Well, I need you as a um, as an observer to help us through this very bad area. And he's quite insulted by this, but he does eventually become the main helmsman of uh, Voyager because he is an, an, a brilliant pilot. And also he's one who has a, one hell of an imagination and that later on in the series he's writing what they call the holodeck programs. He, he, uh, he writes some that are quite interesting. I'm not going to get into them because that would take way too long to talk about. But he's one that has a creative mind. He has this creativity in him, this artistry. If So you, you might want to say that. He's an artist in a lot of ways. And with Lieutenant Malloy... He got into trouble for drinking a lot, and uh, like the character, and so and also he's been known to do graffiti a lot too. So I mean he's done his bad boy thing similar to Tom Paris, and has been given desk duty. And when Ed gets his ship, because he's told he has to ha find a helmsman, and he's like, well that's easy. I'm getting Gordon Malloy. Like he says it without a doubt in his mind, because uh, the Admiral he's talking to, Admiral Halsey, says, well, are you sure about that? Can you control him? He's like, I take responsibility for him. Yes, I'll do that. So uh, that's where uh, Malloy comes in. And Malloy's character also has a lot of artistry. Um, the one thing he loves writing... Well, similar to the holodeck in Star Trek, there's what they call the simulator. It's the same sort of thing, where it's like holodeck, uh, simulator, holographic characters, holographic situations. And the first time we meet him, he's in the simulator, madly he, in a like fighting this great big ogre in a samurai village. And it's a program that Gordon has created. And later on in the series, uh, 
there's another program that they have and he decides, oh, I'm going to tweak it up a little bit. So he changes it. I'm not going to say exactly what it was, but let's just say every time I hear this song, girls just want to have fun. I envision the, the scene that it's in, in this particular episode. I believe it's the episode called Without a, or for, About a Girl in the first season. It's the third episode in. But he has this creative streak to him. And then later on in the series, not that we ever saw, I don't think we ever see Tom Paris do anything musical, but the actor himself who plays a part of uh, Gordon Malloy, that would be Scott Grimes. He's a very accomplished singer. And so they've brought that into the character too, which is a brilliant idea. Um, but anyway, here, when you think about these, and I'm, I'm sure there's a, like a lot of other things too, Maybe even the shape of the ship is similar to uh, the one that they have, the Orville being um, kind of like a similar, almost aquiline, um, very, uh, very uh, slender ship. Um, looks very poetic in a lot of ways. And um, yeah. I mean, there's uh, there's different things there, and it's just interesting to see that. So, for any of you who are still on the fence about whether you want to watch this series or not, but if you've loved watching Voyager, which went on for seven years, I highly advise you to give the Orville a chance. Like, yes, the first season. They threw a lot of comedy in there that wasn't necessarily needed, but that was because. The big wigs wanted it to be a comedy. And I mean, by the time you get to the third episode, you're like, this isn't funny. This is some serious stuff in the episode about a girl. And like, they like, started weaving the seriousness in. Like, of course, the first two seasons, they were designed for television, for Fox television. And so the each episode's around just over 40 minutes long. But when you get to the third season, which took about two or three years, thanks to COVID, to get filmed, that one was on Hulu. Hulu gave them a little bit more um, flexibility with designing the episodes, which meant that each episode is basically a feature-length film. And this, the tone in it is fantastic, um, like very serious. As serious as most anything in uh, in Voyager. Because Voyager, well, I mean, they had experienced writers. They had the money back of them. And they had the contract there already for being there for quite a few years. And the sad thing right now with the Orville is it doesn't have that contract yet. I say yet because uh, there is... There have been rumors going about that there's a negotiation going on between Seth MacFarlane and Fuzzy Door Pictures, which is his company, and either Hulu or Disney+. Plus. And in all honesty, I mean, when there's other shows that they have on there that are already established that they're handing money to, like no offense meant to Doctor Who or anything, I mean, that one, by the way, was originally created by a Canadian. Um, but I mean, they're handing production funds to what they say is a proven commodity. And I just hope that by me putting this video up, that a few more people out there who watch or have seen Voyager give this series a chance. Like, yes, there's a lot of humor in there that's kind of crass and that. And um, Derulio, ugh, I do not like that character. But uh, weird blue guy aside, um, I mean, there are some very brilliant elements in this series. Um, give it a chance. Watch it through uh, Disney Plus or Hulu, whichever platform you have. But keep in mind that Seth MacFarlane himself ever since he was a kid, was a huge fan of Star Trek. So yes, it's going to have its influences, 
from these different series. Um, I'm not even going to get into the comparison between Data and Isaac and Lore and um, Kalon Primary. I'm not going to get into those comparisons at all. Um, I could, but I'm not going to. I'm not this video anyway. But in any case, please give this show a chance. Think of these comparisons. If there's anything else you can see in there that's similar, we'll put it in the comment section here. And also, uh, don't be afraid to let other people know what you think about this series. Because it is good. It's very good. Especially when you get to the third season. But you kind of have to watch the first two seasons because it is a series. There are elements in that first season. And I'm thinking especially of episode three about a girl. That come into play in the second season. And big time. Big, big, big time in that third season. Where we hear, meet the child that the topic of conversation was about in about a girl, and it's quite a roller coaster, but it's worth watching. And certainly, when you get to the episode of Midnight Blue, if you're aware of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, uh, problem that's been in existence at least in Canada I'm guessing it's probably in the US as well and maybe even Australia uh, I don't know but keep that in mind when you get to that episode because there's a lot of it I mean that, that's a beautiful thing about science fiction and the way it can make commentary on things that are going on now um, I mean, in season three, I mean, they hit on all these different things that are very relevant. Uh, like I said, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, uh, suicide, depression, uh, and this sort of thing, gender identity. Uh, there's a lot of things in there that conventional television and storytelling can't really tell but you have that science fiction element you can tell these stories and it gives the chance for these stories to be told and that is something that's hugely valuable in today's society is to have that chance to tell those stories and I believe that giving this series a really good looking at and throwing up some support there for her Seth MacFarlane, Fuzzy Door Pictures, and everyone else who works on the show, Tom Constantino, who I believe is one of the main editors, and certainly the cast and crew. Give it a chance. But think about those comparisons I mentioned too between Voyager and the Orville. Anyway, I can say I've gone really long on this, so I'll have to have it uh, upload probably overnight. But uh, in any case, see you on the other side. And uh, when you get the chance to give the series, the Orville, the chance. And if you can see how beautifully done it is, I mean, not just the storytelling, which is like, of course, the heart of it, but... The other protection value too, like, you know, the makeup, the costumes, um, the voices that are being used by the characters. Because a lot of these actors are not necessarily American. Um, the man who plays the part of Isaac, he's straight from England. But he's able to do his voice in a tone that is not at all English. But you hear the man talking, you, like out of character and you know he's from England you can tell it by his voice and there's other actors in there too I'm not going to get into it but there's a lot of them who are international actors uh, like other international actors in it and just that chance to have all of these different voices come together and tell these stories 
It's a part of the future.